It's uh, 8.35, so we'll get started today, Tuesday, January 18th, the fourth class of this managing this, the startup small enterprise and what I like to call from concept to reality. So why does everyone get access to the lecture recordings while you have to pay to attend? It's a very fair question. I don't want to be uh, a smart ass about it. So one, I think, look, there's a number of reasons. Um, and I admit some of these are kind of violin music in the background, you know, and uh, what not very idealistic and you could roll your eyes at some of them, but this is my thinking. And again, sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. One, you guys are getting credits for them. Uh, other people are basically paying with their time, uh, not getting anything tangible, so to speak, in the near term. Um, the main point though really is you guys are in the arena now. You guys are in this class, as I told you early on, you should take advantage of the opportunity to actually take a concept you have and turn it into reality uh, versus largely those few people who may watch these if I post them on LinkedIn or YouTube without any of your faces or audio, they are in the stand, so to speak. They are particip They are not really participants, right? So that is, um, <clears throat> that is another uh, distinction. I would almost say uh, at the risk of being a bit uh, cocky about it, you guys are getting a kind of a white glove service, right? There was a fellow student a few weeks ago that had a pretty important legal question regarding her project. I ran it by one of the top lawyers in the country, which hopefully that answer is gonna save that student a lot of headaches and sleepless nights in the future. Uh, another student emailed me their pitch deck and I not only I reviewed it, I shared it with a colleague of mine who's really well versed in, in that space. We've been having a back and forth. I may help that person with funding and open up my network, which again, I would definitely lean in more to you guys as students who are paying and enrolled in this class versus strangers. When they email me, I'm glad to help them, but I don't have the same responsibility. Um, I've said this many times, diversity, equity, equality, um, and inclusion is not just a hashtag. Ultimately, it's about opportunity. And I'm a bit naive, but you know, yesterday was Martin Luther King Day and not to use his name, you know, uh, unfairly, but au contraire, I think that is all about, that message is all about extending the table. My purpose is here to serve. I want to help entrepreneurs. And that doesn't necessarily mean just entrepreneurs who, or aspiring entrepreneurs who had the great privilege to be able to enroll in this class. If there's people outside, um, you know, especially noting that the best entrepreneurs don't necessarily even enroll in MBA class, let alone can't even afford class sometimes, um, you know, I think it's a good reminder that your success in life does not really come in other people's losses. That's the great thing about entrepreneurship. You guys could benefit and others could benefit and the pie grows for all. And ultimately, this is stakeholder mindset. Um, if society's gains out size outweigh the individual's gains, let alone individual's perceived loss, well, that's basically stakeholder mindset in and of itself. Now, the only thing I would say is you guys, should, whoever feels anyway, good, bad, you know, just you should be comfortable to talk to me. Um, I recognize not all leaders, not all employers, not all teachers are going to share that. So I'm not saying to naively run into a burning house and tell a professor or a boss, I disagree with you. But when you work with people that do seem to have an open mind and open spirit, it's really, really a good opportunity for you to push back and ask questions and get your point across. Uh, because on judgment day, you're not in the room when people decide your fate. So, you know, I hope this addresses that question. I don't think this was a widespread uh, feeling if it was. And if there's any questions, again, um, I'm here to answer them. But I do think that the overall positives uh, outweigh any possible negatives. So on that note, if there are no questions, I will continue. Um, so we started this class, and I said there's all these different pillars. The introduction was the fiber of entrepreneurship, where we looked at how entrepreneurship has changed and how entrepreneurs have changed over the last 200 years. Um, and then the first pillar was really the timing and conditions of entrepreneurial and success. And so today I wanted to kind of put aside the violin and get into more some, not necessarily hardcore numbers and number crunching, but actually discuss finance and accounting, or as I like to call it, the tangible intangibles, which is how not to lose your shirt. I don't know if any of you um, saw the watch any football. I've gone through periods where I used to really be into sports watching. Uh, then I was too busy, but now it's kind of as escapism, you know, the Sunday as I was working out um, as part of my rehab, which we'll discuss in a later class. Um, I was watching some of the matches, and in one of them, the Dallas Cowboys were playing the San Francisco 49ers, and the Cowboys ran out of time, right? So 
big symbolism and metaphor with startups, the name of the game is to stay in the game. You don't want the clock to run out of you and you don't want to run out of money basically, right? Um, your startup dies basically when two things happen. You run out of money and when you run out of passion. So it's kind of very emotional there, but it's true. Um, we've covered two quite a bit. We will cover it quite a bit in the future as well, because entrepreneurship is a very long endeavor. It's a marathon, as you've heard the cliche. Um, but, but, but fundamentally, um, I think today we're going to talk a little bit about one, how not to run out of money. And it's good to remember that, frankly, a dollar of revenue that you can generate is just as good as a dollar that you save. And so in my uh, career, I've been really, really lucky um, to have a great education, and that included understanding accounting, whatnot. Uh, something that I preach and many others do as well is it's it's kind of criminal that students, regardless of what they study, whether it's fine arts, philosophy, communications, you know, medicine, law, don't actually get a good understanding of personal finance, which includes taxes and stuff like that. Um, I feel like nowadays that should almost be a mandatory course, especially in entrepreneurship. You're going to need somebody on your team that gets accounting. I'm not saying a CPA, a CFA or CA type of accounting necessarily, but that somebody is like, it's kind of using another football analogy. The highest paid player on a team is usually the, the quarterback. Sure, running back wide receivers, if they're great at what they do or like elite, they will also be commanding really, really high salaries. But generally there's an offensive lineman that protects the quarterback's blind spot, right? So that analogy is very much pertinent in entrepreneurship. And I feel like accounting, if you add psychology and sales, that's what you get in finance. Um, but, but you really need to, hopefully somebody didn't get sacked there, but you really, really need to um, understand things like cash flow and whatnot. So there are three key financial statements in business, balance sheet, changes in cash flow, and income statement. And for the sake of a startup, it's really a lot more about the income statement because the balance sheet basically captures the health of an organization at a time with regards to cash, debt, shareholders' equity. The changes in cash flow is really, really critical. It's basically how much cash went out, how much cash came in. Do you have more cash, less, less cash? And then what do you do with that cash? But the income statement, which basically looks at a period, usually it's a year, but as a startup, you almost care about it monthly, quarterly, more than a year. It's basically how much revenue did you book? What were your costs? And then did you lose or gain money? And so this weekend, um, as an example, uh, when it was reported that New York Times was buying The Athletic, I don't know how many of you know about The Athletic, but The Athletic basically a few years ago said, hey, opportunity, a lot of a lot of local journalists who cover sports teams because of the decimation of the print industry, they're being squeezed out. They're losing their jobs. So the athletic raised a ton of venture capital, $530 million to be precise, and went out there. And basically, um, they basically said, we're going to hire all these journalists and we are going to um, bring them on board and they're going to cover their beat, which is say like, you know, there's, there's somebody who might be covering the Montreal Canadiens for them this year. And so they, and I know there's a question, so I'm going to just finish this example and then uh, we'll open up the, the floor to, to Mo. And so basically they said, we're going to go out there and we're going to hire these journalists and then we're going to build a business model, which is subscription based. And, you know, we'll, we'll be worth billions of dollars. The problem was that subscriptions are great, but to sign up subscribers, uh, they had to give away a lot of these subscriptions. And the overhead that they need was, was massive, right? So it was reported that Amazon, Condé Nast, DraftKings, and the big private equity firm TPG were interested in The Athletic, but ultimately the New York Times outbid them all and offered $550 million to seal the deal and win it. So why did the New York Times able to bid everybody else? And why was the price 550? I think fundamentally the price was 550 because the athletics investors had invested 530. So they were not gonna give up their, their, their investment at a loss. I think that's a lot of times how prices are determined in these, I wouldn't call the athletic distress, but from a financial perspective, it was basically burning money, right? It had raised $100 million and lost that in two years, right? So, so there's a problem there. But if you look at this um, 
you know, at this PL, this profit and loss statement, as I tweeted over the weekend, I said, it's accounting 101. The athletic made no sense for TPG. It made no sense for Amazon. It made no sense for Condé Nast, maybe a little bit more than the others, but only the New York Times has the existing infrastructure where it could leverage the asset and over time, admittedly, get rid of a lot of the cost redundancy, right? So the cost of revenue for the athletic is just what it pays the journalist. But now everything else in terms of research and development, selling general and administrative, all of that the New York Times has. So that is probably what pushed those operating expenses is what pushed the athletic into the red. And long story short, this will probably turn out to be a good deal, even if the New York Times had to overpay a little bit by 10% to secure the deal, um, because it will be able to basically just pay those writers and leverage its existing base. So finance is really, really important. Accounting is really, really important because oftentimes it will have this kind of impact on your exit. So ultimately, you know, the, the financial planning and analysis is critical. I'm not going to bore you with all of that, but, but understanding, you know, how your cash flow, um, you know, kind of flows in or out of your company coffers will determine whether you sell an asset like the athletic that you raise $530 million for a mere uh, $550 million or whether you can sell it for billions, right? Um, and so along with, you know, what is the role of financial planning analysis? Some of it is more like historical. What was our cash flow? What are debt to equity ratios? If some of you wanna use debt, we're gonna look at sources of capital. It may seem boring, but the bank will want to know that. And then also, what is your net profit, right? To think of Yogi Berra, we lose money, but we make it up in volume. That doesn't make sense, obviously. So it's important to understand not just what your net profit is, but what your profit margin is. And again, when I will share these slides, you can click through and read more about it. And so the responsibility of your financial planning and, and analysis team, which at first could be one individual, and in my company early on, it was me, was we would basically just look at the cost efficiency of what we did. I had to prepare some kind of budgets every time I went out there and tried to raise funding only get, to get turned down. I needed to prepare budgets. And also I needed financial models, right? And I needed to forecast, right? So you kind of need to have some kind of understanding of what your business will look like, even if it's not accurate, just because investors and lenders want to understand how you think and see the market. So there's different roles, you know, I think most of you early on just need somebody that's frankly like an accounts payable receivable clerk. Again, that could be you. It's not efficient, but it may need to be you early on just to make sure employees are paid, the government's paid, you know, suppliers are paid. And, and that is actually a competitive advantage. You know, when we started our one of our much larger competitors, Vice Media was always shredded in the trade publications because they had a history of not necessarily being very nice to their freelancers. Even when I didn't have two nickels to rub together, I paid all of our freelancers like net zero. I paid them right away. One, because in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't our biggest expense, but because it commanded loyalty and they would be more willing to write for us. And that's why we retained a lot of our freelancers in addition to retaining a lot of our employees. Now, as you evolve, and it's Frankly, if you then go out and raise capital, and today times have changed. When I started, there wasn't that much capital out there. Nowadays, there's a ton more options. You will probably need a controller. Now, a controller is more of a tactical position, and they care about compliance and reporting. Eventually, you could bring on a VP of finance or even a, a chief financial officer that is a bit more strategic. Now, when you raise large rounds, sometimes your investors will want a CFO. The reason for that is because a CFO is really three things in my opinion. Yes, they oversee reporting, but they actually play a big role in strategy because finance will determine and help you navigate what are lucrative areas to pursue, which sometimes an entrepreneur, if they have a background in technology or creative, may not inherently understand. And then third, certainly last but not least, in areas of corporate development, mergers and acquisitions. All right, so continuing um, on this, there's a lot of definitions, you know, what is a bookkeeper, what is an accountant, if you didn't study accounting or finance, it what doesn't hurt for you to just read these again I will share this with you, uh, Elias or myself will upload this to my course. Uh, it's helpful because sometimes you don't want to go out there and try to hire a CFO if all you need is a bookkeeper and vice versa. 
Now, you also nowadays, or I mean, I would say going back a decade, you have these like virtual CFOs, which before we worked from home and virtual meant something else, were kind of time-sharing CFOs, right? It may be overkill for you to bring on a CFO just for your business. So you could technically take somebody who's kind of experienced, they've been there, done that, maybe they're burnt out of working for one company 60, 70 hours, and they basically spread their time around multiple. It may not be necessary. The one thing that I want to caution you is you're going to get a lot of people coming to you and sometimes saying, hey, and I'm not talking about an investment bank whose business it is to do this, especially if you're big enough, you want to do this. But I'm saying that when you're still small, you're going to get a lot of individuals and firms coming out to you and saying, hey, give us a fee, an engagement fee plus a success fee, and we're going to kind of help you package your materials and make some introductions and help you raise money. And then if we help you raise money, we'll get a success fee. I generally discourage startups and entrepreneurs from paying anybody an engagement fee for that, unless if it's really reasonable, one-time small you know, and, and the person is reputable and you check them out. But in general, you want to avoid charlatans of any kind. And I'm not saying those people are charlatans. I'm just saying it doesn't really make sense, uh, especially nowadays when there's a lot of capital out there. Now, all of this is really a means to an end. You have to articulate, capture, and report your revenue and your costs. But that's premature. You first have to visualize, we talked about vision, what your revenue model is. Ergo, there's a fundamental fundamental difference when you arrive on the scene and you see an opportunity and as an entrepreneur you want to pursue it that's like arriving in Manhattan in 1700 you need vision to realize that there could be this awesome thing here in the future of course when you arrive into an existing market and the businesses have been defined and the revenue streams have been defined and there's like hundreds of years or decades of best practices then you're kind of navigating in Manhattan in the 21st century I can't show up in Manhattan now and say, well, I want to rent a place under these terms. They're like, sorry, it doesn't work that way. If you want to rent, this is the way it works. These are the rules of engagement, et cetera, et cetera. Remember that pyramid that I alluded to on one side? That's the first time I shared it on a TechCrunch article. Um, then over time, I guess we got some designers, so it became a bit more snazzy. It wasn't, I mean, in all fairness, this turned out to be very much accurate. And even the folks at YouTube were, would describe this to talk about content, head, premium content, torso, shoulder content, content that's related to the, the main event, so to speak, long tail content. It was all this notion of this content pyramid, this hierarchy of you know, premiumness and whatnot. But the idea is that you have to find a way to articulate your vision to investors, right? So early on, this is actually literally an old document I used to use where I would kind of like, I guess we use simply accounting. And this was part of the Mojo Supreme incubator. And we had all these different types of categories, display advertising, tech stats, video licensing. I mean, this is like, you could NFT this, you know, in terms of for entrepreneurs, this was literally what I used back in 2009. And our revenues were kind of puny. We generated a whopping I think $13,000 to $14,000 in January of 2009. It was kind of pathetic. And the kind of green, I remember, was it's ran and we collected the money. Even a year later, in January of 2010, we were still only generating sixteen to $17,000. And that year, look on top in black, we generated a measly $486,000. Now, it's not measly if this was our first or second year. This was like our fifth year of operation, right? And I think yellow connoted it hasn't run yet. And as you can see, I'm sharing this because I always had forecasts. I had a low and a high. You know, I envision in this scenario, Meta Cafe to generate $10 to $150, you know, but ultimately all of these contributed to generate enough to keep the lights on. Again, I didn't pay myself for five, six years. I think you see why. Um, again, nobody's really seen this. This was more or less what our revenues looked like in the first five, six years. We launched in 2006. Um, we lost money, you know, too many in Montreal at the time when I would see my accountants and lawyers to kind of wrap up our, our books, they thought I was crazy. They're like, Ash, let me introduce you to some great shrinks. You need help. Why are you doing this? Um, but we finally broke even. And to the other side, you see our competitors. Our competitors went out and raised a ton of money. Ripe TV, $45 million in funding. By the time I used this in a deck, they had already shut down. On networks, a little fun fact, ended up basically selling whatever remnants they had to Complex, which went on and launched 
you know, hot ones and all that and recently got acquired by BuzzFeed. And so we did not even raise a million bucks. That was just to show we didn't have that much capital. As I alluded to, we had basically a quarter million dollars that I had in savings plus $500,000 that I needed to get through, you know, credit lines, credit cards, mortgages, and other legal means. Um, but we stayed lean, right? And one of the reasons was my competitors would go out and hire very expensive CEOs, very expensive CFOs to appease their investors. It would become almost like a vicious cycle. Whereas I had a different vision. You could see my personality is a bit different. I didn't say what investors wanted to hear. At the time, it was all about shareholder you know, mindset. And I was here talking about stakeholders and freelancers and employees and the community. And they thought I was some hippie or something, um, even though I wasn't. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with being a hippie, by the way, but the point was I knew we had to stay lean, not because I wanted to keep my foot on the brake, but it's because I knew there was no economic model. I relied on history. I relied on psychology, sociology, and anthropology. And I was like, there's no way these, you know, these, these vast sums of money are going to make sense right now. You got to stay lean. So depending on the industry that you're in, you're probably going to have to adopt either a very lean approach, or if the industry makes sense, a very kind of capital as a strategy approach. And so we finally broke even in 2011. And I assure you, we generate more than $800,000 a year now. But at the time, this was literally my reality. And it was five, six years of sleepless nights. So even back then, this is 10 years ago, it's always very transparent. Uh, part of the reason maybe the accountants were like, maybe you should see a shrink. But I remember somebody asking on Quora, how does Watch Mojo make money? This is 10 years ago. And so I went there, just transparent, open book that I am, and I pasted the answer. And what's really impressive, false modesty aside, is that was the model that ended up happening. I said, you're going to have these platforms, and over time, they will converge. But at the time, the web, out of home, wireless, and OTT, which was not even a word people use, but basically over-the-top devices, I said, those still have different economics. And then you have these sources, and the sources are either licensing, people that pay you a flat fee, to just access your catalog, syndication partners, which is advertising share, revenue share, and then marketers where, you know, let's say Activision or Sony or Netflix comes and pays you to sponsor something. And I said, you're going to have these resources on these different platforms. And ultimately, what took off really was revenue share once there was enough ad dollars in the ecosystem, right? Switching gears, we're now going to talk a little bit about sources of capital. Um, remember the first class, I said, what's the difference between being entrepreneurial and being an entrepreneur? So I want to say four or five years ago, I was with my kids and we went to a park and I ran into a fellow entrepreneur named Mitch Joel, who I used to read when I was like in high school. He used to write for this print newspaper magazine called Mirror or Hour, which predates you guys. I might as well be talking about fax to mach machines and whatnot. But I ended up when I started working in the internet um, industry at search engine mama, Mitch Joel was an employee there. He worked in sales. And then Mitch went on to work in an ad agency, Twist Image, sold it to WPP, pretty successful uh, entrepreneur, very successful speaker. You know, but to me, he's Mitch. I just went up to him and he, you know, it was like, hey, how's Watch Mojo? I go, Watch Mojo is great, but you know, it's kind of like weird. It's always the cycle. And I'm like, there's all these opportunities and we kind of built a machine to do X. When I want to do Y, getting the organization and individuals who are specialists of what they do is a challenge. And he goes, I totally get what you mean. It's the difference between, you know, being an entrepreneur and being entrepreneurial. And I'm like, oh, wise Mitch, you know, King Solomon, tell me, what do you mean? You know, and I say that compliment is as a compliment. And he goes, well, look, Ash, the difference is an entrepreneur actually uses his or her own capital. Whereas I'm always going to be entrepreneurial, uh, but, you know, new ideas, new things I want to experiment. But he's like, yeah, you know, I'm not sure if I have it in me to go out there and risk my own money to throw it at ideas and make sure everybody else is aligned. And to me, it was like, you know, wow, like this eureka moment. I was like, I see the light. And throughout my career, I've gone through those different phases, right? So in the context of sources of capital, look, I use my savings, partly because I really believe in the business like opportunity. Like I was like, wow, storytelling is moving to video. The world is going to be consuming all this content on mobile. I know as a storyteller, I could produce that kind of content for that. But it was also um, because out of necessity, I jumped off a mountain. I didn't have a parachute. I had to figure out how I was going to land as I was coming down onto earth. 
And I kind of had to dip into my savings. I then had to sell whatever shares I had. I had to sell my RSPs, which are 401ks to those five people who are watching this online. And, and it sucked, but it was, I believed in myself. You know, I was always very shy in some ways. And people, okay, I, I, when, I, when I discuss this with my super loving, smart spouse, she's like, you're not shy. You're not an introvert. You're, you're outgoing and stuff. I go, yeah, but there's a difference. I may be an extrovert and I may talk a lot, but that's a shell. I'm actually very shy. I'm actually very aloof. And I'm not that confident. When I started my, my company and I, when I started my career, I still have actually a lot of self-doubt. And that's a normal feeling, right? But I kind of said, okay, I believe that the winds, you know, the headwinds that we have, I believe the opportunity is so huge that I'm willing to bet on myself. So to me, there was no doubt, but also I had no choice. If I wasn't going to dip into my savings, I would have had to lay off my team. If I laid off my team, the company would have died because I did not produce videos. So yeah, it's kind of in hindsight, bet on yourself. But for me, it was also out of necessity. I then had to use credit cards and mortgages and credit lines, right? So it goes back to your reality. That's what I said about the conditions. You need the timing to work. If your spouse does not support you as an entrepreneur, I got news for you. You're dead on arrival, right? If you got kids and a mortgage, it's hard. If you're a single parent, you know, struggling to make ends meet, you got a job, you're taking classes at night. Yeah, I'm not going to be the idiot who's like, why don't you become an entrepreneur? He or she's like, it's impossible. When do I have time to do this, right? So these are all realistic factors. Now, venture capital has changed. In the 60s and 70s, remember we talked in an earlier class about semiconductors, the chips in those semiconductors being made of silicon, Silicon Valley. So the people that bet on Intel, the people that bet on Sun Microsystems, the people that bet on Apple, they, you know, the, they were the original um, kind of gunslingers that basically built the venture capital industry. I'll make sure to link to all these names and, and you know, properly you could go and research them. And they were really, really risk takers who had the vision. Now, over time, that has changed. Venture capital is not what it was then. You now have angel investors. And as your company grows, then you actually move on from VCs and you raise capital from private equity and growth capital. So if you're raising money from angels, yeah, you probably are not at a point when you need a CFO. VCs, you're on the cusp. But kind of the doubles in the details. But by the time you're engaging with private equity and growth capital, yeah, sure, you need a CFO. Because if you don't have a CFO, it probably means your business is not developed enough, right? The bottom line, though, is investors are your cellmate. Choose wisely. That's a quote. I said that. And you're going to be living with these people for years, so you have to be careful. You know, I was very lucky. One of my first advisors was an investment banker named Jim Conley. He became a friend. He was really good. Uh, he was a good person. He was good at, at being like my ambassador in New York. I, I spent a lot of time with him from 2008 to 2011. Uh, we still stay in touch. But there was plenty others who I avoided like the plague, right? I think you just have to vet people well. I've learned, like, and I'm going to get to this in a later on about building a team. Sometimes we as human beings project onto people what we want to hear. It's another thing my spouse tells me quite often. She's like, you gave the guy the answer. He repeated your answer. No wonder why you think he's a great candidate. I'm like, mm, ah, good point. So I think you just have to ask people. It's also fine. You can ask somebody when you're at the altar, um, can I get some references? I want to make sure you're going to be a good spouse. Yeah, that, they're going to be offended. But you can ask them, hey, I'd love to pursue this opportunity. Do you mind just connecting me to a couple of people you've helped? Just so I see how you could help me, how I could help you help us. You know, and, and people are going to bring different skill sets. Again, in a couple classes, we're going to talk about building a team and uh, I'll discuss all of that. So assuming there are no more questions, let's continue. So venture capital has changed. Now you have like this concept of lean startups, MVPs, minimum viable pro pro products. And so it's crazy to just think one size fits all if you are an experienced, accomplished, uh, entrepreneur who has exited two, three times, look, you could go out there on, based on a conversation, raise a hundred million dollars. But if you are a first time entrepreneur, you could have a business plan, you could have a lean startup, you could have a, even a, you know, a minimum viable product. You may not be able to raise a penny unless you have clients who vouch for you and traction. So it's not like, there's no real formula for fundraising because it's really you what it is you want to do and who you're going up to. 
it's like kind of a slot machine. You got to make those three cherries appear for you to end up basically getting the cash. Now, the other thing that's changed dramatically going back 10 years, but definitely 15, 20 years, is the venture capital investment as an asset class has gone mainstream. When I started, I used to say, hey, athletes, entertainers, they're going to become investors and they're going to become entrepreneurs and they're going to want to invest in this stuff. And people were like, nah, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Today, Kevin Durant, he's a prolific investor. Nas has invested in more startups than most VCs have, right? It's just because it's gone mainstream. And frankly, the returns, you know, it's true that uh, uh, in a portfolio, you might have nine clunkers, one home run, grand slam, and that makes up many times the money that investors put in a fund. But the returns for good venture capital managers are actually pretty attractive. So it does attract a lot of capital. And this is why there's so much capital out there now. That doesn't mean that all VCs are good. There are charlatans amongst us all. Now, another thing that has emerged of late, which is pros and cons, is a safe, a simple agreement for future equity. I wish, I, I won't lie, I wish I had this when I was starting off because it does help raise money faster, but it also comes with its set of problems. Because ultimately, you are raising capital really easily at the early stage, but I would say not nine times out of 10, but six or seven times out of 10, you're also setting yourself up to have a very hard time to raise a subsequent round because there's a disconnect between the terms of that safe and your reality later on when your business is a bit more fleshed out. And last but not least, depending on what you're doing, you may not need any of that and you can maybe rely on crowdfunding. Peloton started off as a crowdfunding uh, project, right? So there are ideas that you could leverage the power of the internet to bypass the historical way to raise money. Now, when you talk about investors, there's this big question, the elephant in the room, should you be the CEO? You might be the founder, but maybe you don't have the business skill, or do you bring in an experienced veteran? In my third book, uh, The Entrepreneur's Manifesto, 10-Year Overnight Success, How Watch Mojo Built the Most Successful Brand on YouTube, I talk about how in 2006, 7, and 8, I would oftentimes meet an investor and that would come up. And I was like, look, it's a means to an end. I want Watch Mojo to succeed. Maybe I shouldn't be CEO. But what I learned was, let's both write down our answers because psychology comes into play. If I tell you I should be CEO, you're going to be like, mm, not sure about that. We know this guy, Bob. Bob is great. But if I say, I don't think I'm ready to be CEO. I should be Chief Mojo. Let's go bring a CEO who's experienced. You're going to be like, hmm, you don't seem as committed. You know, we're betting on you. If you're not here, there's no investment. And so psychology plays a part. But the reality is these winds tilt from one spectrum to the other. There was a time even Steve Jobs lost his job. Now, Apple at the time was not a startup, but they went out and brought in an executive, John Scully from Pepsi. That's blasphemy today. Today, we have seen historically founders tend to be better managers of their businesses when we're talking about startups. Mark Zuckerberg, the Google guys are not necessarily CEOs, but they're still around. But YouTube, uh, Google's best explosive growth came when they were still CEO. Now, granted, they went out and brought Eric Schmidt, who could be the adult in the room. But historically, look at Apple. Tim Cook is probably a, a better manager than Steve Jobs, but Steve Jobs found its purpose again with Steve Jobs coming back. So, more likely than not today, you won't have to face this question, but you do need to think about the answer. And as I like to say, if fundraising is marriage, then is M&A is selling your baby a death sentence. This is an old article I wrote on TechCrunch. If you click through it, you'll be able to read. I personally think there are some conditions where it does make sense to bet on yourself. It's more about those fundamentals of you, the, the product, the company, the industry, the stage of the industry, and if you could eventually become profitable. Because you don't want to be in a situation where you're doing all this to go raise money I did fundamentally believe that given what I was doing, we would get to a point where maybe we could just be profitable based on operations. It would have been nice to raise capital. But if you are like in an industry where you need to go and there's no real path to profits, you do need to fund it, you'll lose money forever, and then you're expecting to sell, it's more than I'm not sure you would want to take the personal you know, savings investments route. I think that's the bigger question. 
a big part of success I've said is like 80% is what you don't do, what you don't say, 20% is what you do, right? But it's also another way of defining success is knowing what you don't know and surrounding yourself with good experts. Yesterday, I was this weekend, I was watching American Greed and one of the episodes was on uh, this lady, uh, something King, who basically bamboozled Dennis Rodman and a number of other athletes, Ricky Williams. And I don't fault the, the gentleman for falling for her. We all fall for scammers. We all fall for liars, cheats, and thieves. It's part of life. And I think oftentimes we're then embarrassed to talk about it. So the, the, you know, the, the criminals continue their, their, their grift. But you still got to give credit to Kevin Durant and Nas to say, hey, I'm going to go out there and bring on people who are capable, who can advise. But I assure you, if you've been successful as an athlete, when there's a gazillion people who want to steal your lunch, and take your spot on the field or on the pitch, you probably are not gonna be a pushover. You know, you're still gonna ask some questions. It's possible when, fi the, when NASA's financial advisor said, yo man, this crypto world is gonna take off and we gotta invest in Coinbase. Is it possible that NAS was like thinking of something else and just signed off? Yeah, but I think, Successful people are also in a lot of situations where they ask questions, they read the room, they read the audience, they read a defense, you get the analogy, and they're like, well, wait, okay, I believe in crypto, but it's possible that Nas said, well, I don't want to take a million bucks and go hardcore in Bitcoin, that might go up and down, but you know what, if Coinbase is like the platform, and it's like they are selling the helmets and the shovels for others to go mine Bitcoin, who cares if they strike gold or not, but Coinbase is going to win. Yeah, 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 I like me this Bitcoin. You know, so I'm not so sure if either extreme is true. I'm not so sure if these athletes and entertainers are idiots or they're geniuses, but they're smart to know what they don't know. Storytelling is going to help you hire better, raise money faster, sell more. Storytelling is everything now. I, I alluded to Steve Jobs mentioning that storyteller is like the most important thing in, in business. Um, absolutely. I mean, we, it's like when I started my career out of school, it was like nobody wanted to be a salesperson. And I was like, wait, we're all salespeople. So I embraced sales. It was, I went from being a finance guy that thought he was going to be like the CEO of Royal Bank when I was working in customer service at Royal Bank to saying, no, 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 no. I want to be selling. And to sell, you need a story. And then I landed in, in where I was. I had an open mind. So absolutely today, to sell, you need to sell, to tell a story. It's about storytelling. Absolutely. Yeah, the MVP, these are all means to an end. It's all, it's like a formula. It's an ingredients in a recipe. Oh my God. I mean, look, when I say I got turned down by 100 VCs, it was probably turned down by 30 corporate venture uh, units like Hearst Ventures, um, Time Warner. Uh, Time Warner turned me down like more times than I'd like to even remember. Uh, which is fine. Um, so look, I think it depends on what it is you're doing. What is your real upside? What is your end game exit scenario? And then do you want them to be helpful or do you want just their money and their seal of approval? And finally, what are the rights to negotiate with them? Like a corporate VC may want to write a first refusal, which could kill your business. But also, if you give them a right of first refusal, and when you want to sell your business, they don't want to buy it, that's a hell of a negative red flag, right? So let's do this for the sake of time. Let me come back to just a whole, in a couple classes, because we have a, a lot of buffer time. I'm going to actually kind of go back and instead of just randomly like stream of consciousness, do a whole rant that would make Eminem jealous about corporate VCs. Let me actually come back to you guys with like a more structured, hey, pros and cons of corporate VCs, some deals that make sense, some deal that did not make sense, and mainly how to negotiate rights, okay? Because I think it's a means to an end. Sometimes it's awesome, sometimes it sucks, you know, but it depends on how you structure it going in, what are your expectations? Cool? So I'll come back to corporate VCs for sure. And I'm very glad I asked you what that was because I could have given a very generic, bland answer. And I, I realized that's a big part of this. That should be a big part of this class, which I was not going to spend much time on. So we'll come back to it. All right. Good stuff. Good participation. Keep it up. And I mean that. So the role of business planning. Ultimately, when I was approached to give this class, they're like, this historically has been all about the business plan. And I was thinking, I was quiet. I actually can be quiet. I was like, that's madness. No investor cares about a business plan. But I was like, I would like the opportunity to be in a class 
with students who want to be entrepreneurs. So I was like, okay, let me think about it. But as you guys have seen, it's a means to an end. I think an executive summary, a memo, which we'll get to a pitch deck and all these, these are more important. So this class, because again, I don't want Miguel to come and shoot me, uh, will involve a business plan. But I think once you exit the classroom and enter the real world, I, I, I would discount the emphasis of the business plan for some of the other tools. And again, it's all a roadmap, meaning it's flexible. You're on this nice journey. It should be fun. There's some anxiety. Ooh, are we going to get lost? Are we going to swerve off the road? I hope we don't die. But it's a road trip. It's not a blueprint that's rigid, that it's like, hey, we missed a step. The building's going to crash, right? So it's, it's, these are roadmaps. That's the main thing I want to emphasize. This is a flashback. The big assignment here is to basically develop a business plan and then present through a deck. We've gone through it. We're going to come back to this again at the end of the class. Now, I like to talk a lot. I like to listen. I like to debate. Like, less talking, more doing. Like that's basically entrepreneurship. There's also a lot of jargon. I came across this over the course of 50 years. There's been so many themes, um, change management, ecosystem strategy, shared value, first mover advantage, time-based competition. I mean, this makes me want to hurl. Some of this stuff is important, but my point is like today, you know, I did an interview with New York Ad Week all about stakeholder mindset, you know, servant leadership, which is basically like what I based my, my management style on. But now it's, it's de rigueur. Now everybody wants to talk about it. And you as an entrepreneur have to balance that, right? There's always going to be buzzwords. There's always going to be like media covering stuff. You're in the arena. You're in the trenches. It's like you're Kevin Durant or whoever, you're LeBron, whoever you are. You just got to get the ball. Again, go back to that Dallas Cowboy scenario against the Niners. You just want to make sure that you put the ball down. You make sure a referee touches it so you can snap put it down and get a second left. If you don't do that and you're concerned with the jargon and the buzzwords and the press, you're going to run out of time, right? So business plans are a means to an end. In the real world, you don't want to be working on a deck. It's like an artist. You don't want to keep adding another stroke of paint, another stroke, another stroke. You want to get your painting out there. It's, it's, a, it's a fluid project is what I'm getting at. They're going to, I remember I have a colleague. He was really good at what he did, but he was working on this short movie of his. It took him a decade. I was like, I get it, but you need to get this out there. You need to get this out there and evolve because this is not your masterpiece, not because it's not a masterpiece and it's not good, but because as an artist, you're going to become stale, right? It's the same thing. You could have a great idea, but if you get buried in the business plan, you're going to miss out on the opportunity. If you recall, I discussed this, which was basically uh, an investor saying, you know, I don't really necessarily care about the pitch deck or I don't care about the business plan. I shared with you some feedback to the new students. I'm going to share this again. You could go and read it. I won't read this because I read John. He goes, you're basically reeling a fish. You start off with just something like an introductory line or sentence to capture my attention and show me why you care, why I need to believe and why I need to join your team. David, again, he goes, Ash, you know, he, I shared this with you. He sent me a follow-up and he linked, which I'm going to share the link with you. He goes, ultimately, you know, this investor goes, I asked, could you make the product? Do people want to buy your product or service? Can you make it so it's profitable? Is there a return on your marketing spend that makes sense? And then can you scale it so that when people give you money, investors, the return goes up and not down? And then people like a platform because platforms generate abnormal returns, right? And that's the case if you look at you know, Google, the Apple Store, Facebook, those are all effectively platforms. Now, Charlie O'Donnell, who is another investor whose fund I've invested in, so I'm an LP in his fund. Charlie O'Donnell, I managed in 2006, if you recall, Mojo Supreme was an incubator. One of the projects was Street Mojo. It was a really neat project. It was like Groupon meets Twitter. And I was really excited about it. And I emailed Fred Wilson, who ended up investing in Twitter and so many other companies. And Fred and I were both bloggers and he would link to my stuff and he was, you know, he was always very complimentary, which was cool. It was kind of like the Pope saying, man, this guy runs a great sermon, right? It was like, it's what you wanted to hear type of thing. Not religious, but you get the analogy. Fred Wilson was like, sure, let's set up a meeting. And I was like, this was Thursday. I was going to be in New York the next day on Friday. Charlie worked for Fred and Charlie comes on on the thread. He's like, no, you don't need to take this meeting. I'll look at it. And he basically killed that conversation. You would think I would hold a grudge. And as I like to say, forgive, but don't forget. And I told Charlie, I go, you killed my meeting with Fred, whom I ended up meeting later on. But I go, in the end, it's all good. 
because Street Mojo was binary. We had to be number one, scale to be huge, and possibly eventually get killed by Groupon or Twitter. But that kind of led me down the Watch Mojo path, so everything happens for a reason. So that's just a little bit of background to remind you that I don't hold grudges, sort of. Um, but he, he nails it as well. A short intro paragraph is everything. Keep in mind that the average investor is looking at different industries and different models. So what you think you're doing is, is completely unique and has never done before. It's very possible that somebody else is doing something close. And I believe that, right? Tesla, Marconi. Um, a lot of great inventors were always doing very similar things. And that's because, again, a great investor is a social scientist. You look at what's happening, what people are doing, and you kind of come up with solutions for that. Um, and ultimately, pitch deck, right? So it goes back to pitch deck, pitch deck, pitch deck. But also, so this is uh, Alexis Ohanian, uh, Mr. Serena Williams. He's a Reddit co-founder, as I like to mention. We're all driven by insecurities. I am as well. When I spoke to Alexis when he was raising money for his new fund, 776, um, I saw the insecurity that was driving him. And that was one reason why I was like, I'm going to back him. Not because he's in entrepreneurial circles, like popular, and he's married to arguably the greatest tennis player of all time of any gender, period. or actually one of the greatest athletes, period. But it was because I, I liked his story. He started Reddit out of uh, Y Combinator, but he sold it early. He keeps talking about that. And, and I told him, I was like, it's fine. I'm like, look, we've all would play things differently a little bit, but I go, that set the stage for you to go do everything else. Reddit and Dig were very much head to head. Dig was the darling. Reddit was an afterthought. Condé Nast bought Reddit and Reddit has gone on. It's going to IPO at over 10, maybe even $15 billion. But Alexis gave all of that up, all of the upside. So I think I'm not saying anything earth shattering, he always kind of regrets that. But the other thing that's really interesting is then he went and he started a fund called Initialized Capital with Gary Tan. And that is a link you could link to and read it. It's returned like 70 times capital. But once Alexis and Gary were initialized, I asked Alexis, I said, why did you leave and why are you starting 7-6? He goes, look, he goes, I felt an obligation to go back to Reddit now just as an employee to help it. So I was kind of the odd man out. I didn't really play as big of a role at initialized capital. And he wants to have his own legacy. He wants to have his own uh, you know, imprint and footprint and all that. So it goes to show we're all, no matter how successful we are, no matter how seemingly popular you are, you could be married to uh, you know, one of the greatest athletes of all time. And you still are out there trying to prove yourself. And as an investor, I hate to break it to you. That's what people look for. And that's what actually always surprises me about all the investors that turn me down. They didn't understand like, wow, Ash is just going to figure it out eventually. I may disagree with the tactic of his, but in the end, he's going to figure it out. And, you know, they're lost. It's all good. No hard feelings. Anyway, all to say a lot of background because background context is king. So Alexis he goes, Ash, I'm a big fan of the memo. He got to me after the class. I emailed all these guys. Some of them got back to me that night. Most people have lives. They don't check their email right away. He got back to me saying, I'm a big fan of the memo. In fact, we're updating our entire application process to become memo-based for anyone to apply on our website to pitch a send quote. So I won't lie. Kind of like with Naruhito, I said, what the hell is CVC again? I go, what's a memo? And I'll get to what a memo is. So we shared the business plan update. Um, I, I'm I'm going to ask you later on at the end when we get to it, how many of you actually went through it? There's also an investor pitch deck. This is Guy Kawasaki, the former Garage Ventures VC. That is, a, it's a template. You don't have to use it, but I'm giving you the tools if you want a kind of a shortcut. But executive summary is really what a memo is. I've alluded to executive summaries. Executive summary is a one or two page distilled version of your longer business plan. And I told you on day one, people are not going to read your business plan. So the memo, that one pager, is ultimately what presents the request, recommendation, or conclusion. It summarizes the main facts, arguments, and evidence. It forecasts, it forecasts the structure and order of information to come. And it kind of gives you a quick overview of the purpose and content of, of what, what's about to come. Um, I linked this. You could go in deeper. And I do think, though, that, like frankly, my pecking order is still even though all these guys are saying the paragraph, paragraph, I agree. I think it's like an email. It's an email that stands out. And then it's the deck. These gentlemen who are actually in more in the business of investing, even though I've invested in 30 startups, these guys are more professional investors. Um, I would be angel VC technically through Granicus. But again, I'm not, um, you know, everybody has their own background, but, but I mean, these guys are really emphasizing the memo. So you guys have to kind of take all this data and figure out what's best. 
I still think it's whether it's memo or deck 1A, 1B, business plan is two or three in terms of priority is the main message I'm getting at. The elevator pitch is also important because oftentimes you're going to find yourself at an event. And again, you're having your little drink in hand. They have their drink in hand. They're eating some shrimp cocktail or something. And you got to pitch to them in a loud venue why it is that you stand out. And the number of times I had conversations, sometimes I would nail it. Amazing. Even if it didn't go anywhere, I'm like, man, that guy might be interested. But, but that is key. You really, really need to have impact. And people have to re remember you. I used to travel all the time to New York, San Fran, LA conferences and all that. I was like the crazy guy with the long name from Montreal. Um, and, and long story short, you had to have impact that 18 seconds you spoke for them to have a longer conversation, right? And so really, really critical. And then the SWOT is something you want to include. Do you think you're better than me, Ash? No, I'm not. I'm not above you. So I actually created a SWOT for you guys. This is how I would define the watch mojo SWOT. Our strengths, massive catalog, proven production model with strong unit economics, deep engagement, our average uh, watch time, six minutes per session, organic reach. We did sponsor the New York Islanders at the Brooklyn... Uh, at the Barclay Center in Brooklyn for a few years. But in terms of customer acquisition, we've never spent money. We could talk later in marketing why I, I, I greenlit the, the Islanders sponsorship. We have a strong brand that resonates with the sought after demographic of men 16 to 34. Fair use, which is a, a, is a threat and a weakness, you could argue, is actually also a strength because we have key relationships with the key stakeholders. The rights holders are now our clients. Like, man, if I would have told you 15 years ago, I'm gonna go out there, take your IP, build editorial around your IP, build a commercial reason uh, business within reason around your IP, and you're either going to pay me to license that IP or you're going to pay me to advertise next to our IP, which is based on your IP, you would have thought I was crazy. Most people think I'm crazy, but there's good crazy and bad crazy. But my point is that's vision, then you got to execute. That's what we did. The fact today is we work with the Paramount. We use their IP, but they also are a client. They could never argue damages, right? So you have to kind of see this game of chess, execute against it, right? And you got to be reasonable. You can't be a condescending a-hole with these guys because then they'll want to make an example out of you. So we also knew which rights holders were kind of bad crazy, you know, breaking a bottle of beer and coming up to you in a bar. You don't want to mess with those guys. We have 30 international editions reaching 150 million viewers in 150 countries. And our team, awesome team, they've worked way too long with me, poor them. They've suffered quite a bit. I'm just kidding. Our weaknesses, there's probably more than four, but you also kind of are positioning. You don't want, it's like, where are you going to stack up? You don't want to have two strengths, 15 weaknesses. I admit we have a talented team, but we're not talent driven. It's not like Taylor Swift is, is like our host. Uh, we have original IP in the industry vernacular, but it's not fully original in that we're using third-party movies and TV shows and games and music to create new IP. It's like news, like parody, it's original IP, but it's not fully original IP. We're a very creative team, lower C, but we don't have creatives, meaning admittedly, we don't have script writers. We don't have like the kinds of people that Hollywood puts on a pedestal. You know, we don't have the directors that are kind of on our team directing our videos. Uh, which is fine. It's just a different part of uh, landscape of the industry. And admittedly, a weakness is we actually lack a scaled owned and operated distribution uh, channel. Our website is tiny compared to the reach we have on YouTube, Snap, TikTok, Twitter, Crapster, and wherever else audiences are going to be. Opportunities, look, we could basically tap into new distribution and create new monetization, TikTok. We could repl uh, re replicate our catalog to go into fast linear, fast, free, ad-supported streaming television you know, basically watching what looks like TV, but on your Samsung without paying Bell or Rogers or, you know, um, NBC, Comcast or Time Warner and basically getting it through the air. And frankly, we could monetize our big audience through direct sales and sponsorships, kind of what we do when we do deals with Netflix and Paramount and Peacock and, and all those guys. The threats, platform risk, hey man, you're building your business on YouTube, Facebook, you're gonna wake up with some bad news, kind of par for the course. Copyright. We manage it really well, but it needs to be mitigated. And we are advertising reliant. Advertising is great for many reasons, but you're reliant on businesses deciding to spend money on something that is quite intangible. So you should create something like that. Again, uh, I'll get to questions because I think we're almost done and then we're gonna open it up to, to question time. So you gotta pick kind of like your medicine, you know, but in, in, in the real world. But here, you need, we're gonna do a business plan and your deck because you're gonna present it 
And so I shared all these again, I'm not gonna go through them all. These are all artifacts of the WatchMojo history throughout the years. I'm not saying to use these as your template. I'm just saying, how did WatchMojo present its opportunity versus what came? Learn from my mistakes, learn from our successes. And again, as I said, you need a thick skin because a lot of people are gonna read your decks and say, I don't get it, I don't understand. You can't tell them to go F off. Even if you want to, you gotta take their feedback, the good, and take it with a grain of salt. 